Hi class, so in the last section we wrapped up um, the discussion with uh, post-impressionism and so we're actually going to continue on into the 20th century with this section, sections 3.9 and just kind of this brief discussion, I'm going to give you about 310, but um, this is really kind of a continuation of what we looked at in 3.8 and sort of moving past that. So kind of just keep that in mind. And as I mentioned in the last video, we'll actually pick up the expressionist part of 3.8 in this um, because I really feel like the expressionists and the foves need to work together. So once we get past surrealism, we'll be going a little out of order as it runs through your book. And so kind of keep that in mind while we're looking at you know two different sections and I'll be working through them as if they're a single one. So today we're really gonna begin at the big start of the 20th century with a group of artists called the Fauves or Fauvism is the style. So at the turn of the century, painters like Matisse really looked to the post-impressionists. He tried to utilize these expressive qualities in all aspects of his painting the color, the subject, and the composition. And so when he found a group of like-minded artists that started working with him, they exhibited together, which completely shocked the public because critics actually dubbed this group the of expressionists, the Fauves, which means wild beasts. And looking at one of Matisse's paintings, I think you can see why this was so shocking. This color was just, non-traditional colors, non-naturalistic colors, um, and Matisse was really their leader. So this is his joy of life, and it's a very early Fauvist work, work and it really shows his enthusiasm for, for life. Um, these vibrant colors, very non-naturalistic, a, a really lovely rhythm to his work, and this was exhibited with the Fauves um, in 1906, and Again, when critics first looked at this, it was utterly shocking. Um, think about all the realists that we've come from with all of these sort of very muted tones and they're soft and pale. And then we have these fauves with the bright colors. They loved red. So you'll see a lot of red used in their paintings. Um, pink, there's this pink sky, um, a yellow earth, orange foliage blue and green trunks within the trees. None of this is very naturalistic at all. And so they really felt that the vision of color was freed from the objects themselves. And like Gauguin, they were really not trying to convince you that they had remade something naturalistic. This is really more about the feelings that the colors and shapes inspired. And so in, if you look at that independently, they would become very expressive. And you see our figures here are made out of very simple lines. Um, our couple in the front that you see on the right side, you don't see her head necessarily. You just assume your eye sort of fills that in. Um, but she's made with almost a single line as well as the male figure. And each of our forms, if you start looking, they're very, very simple forms. And so this was more about the expression of color and the feeling than it was making things very, very naturalistic. And that can be seen here in harmony in red as well. We have this rich kind of maroonish tablecloth with these very deep blue vine patterns on both the table and the wall. And really almost gives you sort of a very uncomfortable feeling trying to figure out what is a tablecloth, what's the wall, which is very simple lines. Um, and what angle is this from? Um, which direction is this? Because your eye fills in the line that says that the table ends next to the chair on the far left, but there's really nothing to suggest this. The, the pattern doesn't change, change direction. It's very flattened. Um, our figure here is very flattened as well. There's a slight bit of shading on her neck, but otherwise she's basically just these swatches of color. And if you start looking around, you'll notice a few other things. Um, if you look at this, this picture that's within the painting, um, you can look at it a couple different ways. One, it's possibly the, the table is next to a window and you're looking out into it. You see the depth of the windowsill or 
it can be a painting within the painting and where the two corners meet is actually just where the edges of the frame meet. So again, sort of this play on space, on um, depth and everything else, very much a flattened space. And he's really trying to give us more of the experience of the place. Um, not really making a window in the world, but trying to relish in art making itself. And so when someone asked him about this work, he actually looked at them and said, why he did, they didn't, they asked why he didn't make this woman much more naturalistic. He's like, I didn't create a woman, I made a picture. So this isn't even trying to fool the eye and tell you that this is reality. This is, here is a painting, this is a painting, it says it's a painting, and it's kind of standing on its own as a painting. Another of the foes is Andre de Rain, and he's another one of the founders. And he really stated that he used color as a means of expression, expressing emotion and not as a transcription of nature. And this is his London Bridge, and he uses these brilliant colors. Lots of primary colors and secondary colors really working with one another. Um, and if you notice, he'll use complementary colors, which makes it very discordant because they really, because Talk, think about how when we talked about primary colors, um, or I'm sorry, um, complementary colors, that they sort of play off one another. They sort of give this sort of push-pull um, and really brighten each other. And so you'll notice the yellows and the blues working, the reds and the greens working together, really creating this very lively composition. And he creates this discordant color combinations really to intensify his colors. Um, and he really works in this faux movement. Um, Matisse and Durain were kind of our two major players in this movement. And it didn't really last but for a couple of years officially. Um, but while it didn't last long, by 1908, the painters kind of started to go their separate ways. But it was really a crucial moment for the development of modern art. It really encouraged artists to look at new ways to express themselves. And um, for two artists from France, this exploration led us to Cubism. And Cubism is this very new approach to representing reality, which brought different views of the subjects, either objects or figures, together in the same picture, resulting in these paintings that really appear fragmented and abstracted. Um, it's believed it was named by the critic Louis Voxelis, who also named the Fauves, um, who said of one of Brock's paintings in Paris that they were reduced to geometric outlines or to cubes, and hence the name Cubism. Um, and Cubists tend to break their works into planes. And so when you look at Cubist art, keep in mind that what you're looking at is... Um, the same looking at different viewpoints of an object or a person at the same time and in the same space and then that's how they create this three-dimensional form but this also emphasizes the flatness of the canvas rather than creating depth and the first painting we're going to look at is kind of cubist but it's probably the one you're most familiar with which is Pablo Picasso's La Demoiselle de Avignon um, or the Ladies of Avignon, and it is named after the Women of Avignon, which is a street in Barcelona, which is associated with prostitution. And so these are very, often when we look at our nude figures in art, um, particularly modern art, they are generally prostitutes. They were the easy ones that they could pay for them to undress to pose for them, basically. And um, the artists were often around in the streets, the same places as the prostitutes were. And so a lot of times you will see prostitutes um, posing for our nude, our nude figures. Now, this is a very radical break from the traditional perspective and flattened, even the flattened forms of the fauves and the postmoderns that we looked at um, previously in, in section 3.8. Um, and Picasso was really inspired by Iberian sculpture and African masks. 
Um, at this time, the African Ethnological Museum had just recently opened and brought all kinds of these masks and sculptures and um, ceremonial costumes and things like that from Africa. And he spent a lot of time in there. Um, and the problem with, with this is he was interpreting the masks in a completely non-culturally correct way. Um, but at the time, they were all very new and very interesting. He kept seeing these amazing simplified forms um, and everything was sort of much more um, boxy and squared off and not so perfectly curved and flowing lines, which you saw in traditional European art at this time. So um, he really found inspiration in these masks and sort of took that and ran with it. Um, so, but here we have these five naked prostitutes in a brothel and they are basically on display. And um, we see one is coming through a curtain. Our figure on the far left is kind of draped as walking from behind a curtain. Our figure on the right has just sort of opened the drape and, behind, and um, is coming through as well. And so if you start looking at our figures here, um, they're in what I mentioned, these kind of cubes and these fragmented and abstracted forms, but we still can tell that they are women. And um, each of these figures, if you look at their faces, the masks, the African mask, we have two African masks truly just copied into this. Um, and you notice our figures are about the same tonal quality as the background. So this really flattens the painting. And this was sort of his foray into what would become cubist art. Um, these flat splintered planes rather than rounded forms. Um, and again, these kind of broken um, shapes. And so um, in one of most in one of his most well-known paintings, you can really see this development of the cubist style. And although you often see this painting um, in the background when cubism is the topic, this really isn't a cubist painting. We have the simplification, but the tonal quality is much brighter than a lot of the cubist works that we'll look at from here on out. But moving on to Brock, you can definitely see how this is much less bright, um, much more abstracted, and his houses at Le Stock. Now, Brock actually began his career working in the Impressionist style. He was even a foe for a little while. So he really had already experienced a lot of styles of modern art by the time he started working with Picasso. Um, there was also this big influence from Matisse on him. Um, and this is really, this is actually from the same town that we saw the um, um, Mount St. Victoire paintings um, of Cezanne. So he's had a lot of contact and really learned from the other modern artists. Um, and so Cuban influence really had this far reaching effect on modern art. And so you see here, as I mentioned before, when I was kind of introducing Cubism, these different angles. We see um, this is houses at Lestock. So our houses have literally been simplified into cubes. There's very little color. There is very little um, um, depth other than there is some shading here. So we do still have that. Um, but we see all of these different forms at varying angles. And again, think about it as if you almost just walked around the town, made a circle and came back and sort of painted it from all these various directions. So it's really trying to put a lot into a single painting. Okay. So again, Cubist influence, very far reaching um, and had a lot of an effect on modern art, which can be seen when we look at the futurists. Um, now, futurism, which is what this style is, is an Italian based movement that really officially launched in 1909 with the Futurist Manifesto. <clears throat> this during this early 20th century, all these different art movements began to write manifestos, basically saying, 
what made something futurist, what made something expressionist, what made something da-da. All of these different styles that we'll look at, they all have a manifesto that basically says how, this, how it works if you're going to work in this style. So again, kind of the ideas of writing about their beliefs and art style really, really becomes popular at this time. And it really kind of begins with the futurists. So the futurists were a really interesting group. They were Italian. It was an Italian based style. Um, and they really emphasized them and were impressed with the movement of motion, machines, light and speed. So there's a lot of movement in their work. Um, they had a very positive outlook on war and the machines. They really helped that because this is World War One um, or right on the cusp of World War One. And they really felt that the war would purify society, kind of bring about the New World Order um, idea. And so they really wanted to destroy all of the old style of art um, and only look to the future. If it was if it was considered classic, if it was considered traditional, they wanted it gone, burned, destroyed, done. And they only wanted to worry about what was going to happen in the future. And they really had this idea of a reconstruction of the universe. And so they felt that through war and um, technology, this could be achieved. And so they really emphasize motion and the idea of motion. And you can see that here in Boccioni's unique forms of continuity in space. This is a bronze. It's been cast a number of times. You see this one was actually cast in 1931. Um, you can see the sculpture in a number of different museums around the world today. Um, but if you look at it, it really does harken us back to a Nike figure from classical Greek sculpture. Uh, with the wind blowing her drapery and things. And it's really sort of based on that, or it really takes on this idea, but it's not so much based on that. It's really more of the idea of the posing, opposing forces, the idea of action being much more important than body. And so really they want you to look at this as not as a figure, but the space and the movement of the wind around the figure as they run or as they move. So this really isn't capturing a human form. It's capturing the interruption of winds and space that the human form creates when it moves. So kind of a, they're, they're very much into this idea of movement. Lots of their art had trains and tanks and all kinds of things in it, um, as well as the use of Fauvist colors. And so they were, they were very much a modern art group. Um, now, Futurism wasn't the only group that was influenced by Cubism, but also our next group is one. Okay, so Cubism and Expressionism both really had far-reaching influence through style and theory, and that's really especially true for um, Marcel Duchamp, who is most famous for his Dada stuff. Um, and when we look at Dada, um, we're talking about a completely different idea. This isn't just art. This is performance. This is lifestyles and things, um, writing, all kinds of these things. Um, the Dada's and the Surrealists, we're going to look at kind of close to, to one another, but Dada sort of really starts this whole idea. So World War One breaks out in 1914. And it was terrible. The world had not seen a war like this before. There were things like trench warfare, poison gas, bombardment by air. There's machine guns and tanks and submarines. And so when we talk about the 20th century, like the 19th century had really put its faith in science and technology in the Enlightenment. And now all of the science and technology was showing the dark side. Um, 10 million people were killed during war. So lots of lots of terror and destruction going on. So in 1916, a group of artists that were waiting out the war in Switzerland, um, actually in Zurich, they banded together as a protest art movement called Dada. And Dada is an ambiguous word. Um, there's 
different beliefs of how it came about, everything from um, looking the word up in, like randomly opening a dictionary and it was in there, to the noise that something, uh, one of the instruments that they had created made, to just, just these random sort of nonsensical things that they did. And Dada really protested everything, and I mean everything. Anti-war, anti-art, anti-middle class, anti-everything. Um, they really wanted to destroy traditional values in art and completely start over. And that was kind of the anti-art thing. So they were, along with the futurists, they weren't as aggressive about it as the futurists, but they were still very much anti-art. And they found a lot of the... Um, the very classics, what were considered classic, what was considered um, all these amazing times and styles, they found them absurd and wanted to basically just get rid of them. So they really wanted to negate the idea that art was timeless and for the ages. Um, they rejected most moral, social, political, and aesthetic values. Um, and they really rejected the rational thinking that started the war um, and they, they did their best to not be understood and really not be pinned down. Um, and here we have Hugo Ball, who is performing dressed as a cubist sculpture at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, which was where a lot of the Dada developed from. Um, and he had this bohemian avant-garde nightclub where artists and writers would meet. And so this really became central to the Dada style. Um, this is his performance of one of his sound poems, which are, is called Carawain. And you see how absurdly he is dressed. And these performances would be him standing up there for an hour, not saying anything, or dancing around and making noises and clapping things together, just very discordant. So again, this sort of anti-art, anti-continuity sort of thing. So, but really, when we talk about Dada, the key figure in this is Marcel Duchamp, um, particularly when he came to the U.S. And he was a key, key figure of the New York branch of Dada. He invented the ready-made. And, and you can't see it, but I'm using invented in air quotes because he didn't actually invent ready-mades. Um, this was really an explanation, exploration in blurring the line between life and art. He started the asking the question of what is art? So later generations will return to this question again and again and again. And Marchamp, Marchamp, Marcel Duchamp was this artist that started this whole thing that says, what's art? Why is something created? Why is one thing art and what is something that's manufactured is not art? Why is something that I made counted as art? The most notorious of Duchamp was his ready-mades, and you see here his fountain from 1917. So it's signed Armut, and um, it, he entered it into a New York art exhibition under the pseudonym Armut. And this was an unjuried exhibition, which meant that there wasn't someone going around and judging everything. And they were told that all entries would be accepted as long as you submitted it and paid the entry fee. Well, this was actually rejected. How can this be rejected in a unjuried exhibition that's not rejecting things? Well, it was. So Duchamp wrote an editorial, which included the Stieglitz photo of the work, called the Richard Mutt case. And the main premise of it was basically whether Mr. Mutt made the fountain with his own hands or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, and he created a new thought for that object. He was declaring this a work of art because he took it out of a hardware store where it would have been sold for a very um, utilitarian use. He put it on a pedestal. He flipped it upside down, making it not usable. It's not usable in the state it's in. So he declared it art. And so this really started to make people think, while it's completely absurd, 
it did make people think, what is art? How much of the hand of the artist actually has to actually be in something for it to be declared art? And he also started this thing, which was called ready-mades. And basically, ready-mades were things that he went and purchased and put on exhibition and did not alter in any way. Um, he also had assisted ready-mades, which he did make some changes to before he put them on display. So this was really a new declaration of democracy, which entitled artists to widen their frame of reference and draw meaning from the world around them. And so it really makes you think, does art have to be made by an artist? How is an art object different from any other kind of object? How does art depend on what context it is? Um, and to what extent do materials have to pass through the hands and mind of the artist to be considered art? Um, so he also has these assisted ready-mades, which I mentioned previously, and this is his bicycle wheel in 1913. It actually predates the fountain, but this is an assemblage of found objects. Now, the original bicycle wheel was lost, but he said, that's fine. He found another one and that was lost too. But in true Dada style, he is not interested in the idea of it being the original bicycle wheel that he put on there. So he dropped another one on and said, hey, it's still good. Um, so Duchamp, when we talk about him, again, a lot of what he did, it was rather absurd, but that was the point. That was really his whole point was, why do we hold standards to people who sculpt and do these, spend all of these time creating things that could be, that you could use, pull from useful objects? Um, he made ready-mades. He also was responsible for kinetic art, which is art that moved, and we've talked about that before. Um, and then also the idea of conceptual art, which I'll mention um, quickly when we talk about 310. So I have one last slide I want to show you from Duchamp, just because, again, he, we really can't overstate his, his influence in the art world at this point. But this is a... Um, work entitled In Advance of a Broken Arm. Now, I don't know that this story is 100% true, but it has been told many, many, many times, and it's always very interesting. Um, if you'll notice, In Advance of a Broken Arm is a snow shovel. So the original one, he bought it, hung it in the studio, but this version is from the Museum of Modern Art from 1964. And there's a really interesting story behind this object. Um, in 1964, the museum acquired it as part of an exhibition on Duchamp. Well, during the time of the installation, a worker at the museum was not aware that this was an object of art, which would have been insured for an extremely large sum of, sum of money. Again, still just a shovel. Um, so he saw it there. He picked it up and took it out and cleaned the museum's sidewalks of snow with it. Of course, the curators freaked out when they found out what had happened. Um, the poor maintenance guy just, you know, had so many issues. And the director of the museum called Duchamp freaking out. And Duchamp immediately thought the entire thing was hilarious. And they were like, well, we'll have a new one. We can buy a new one. We can bring it in. He was like, no, 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 no. We let things happen, so he didn't want any of the scrapes or scratches that it may have ended up with removed. He didn't want anything else done to it. He actually said, now it's an assisted ready-made. Continue, on, continue on with the exhibition. Just rename it assistant ready-made. So that's just the type of thing that, that Dada really looked at, the absurdity that art was so precious and so meticulous about everything. So... All right, so let's move on to surrealism. So in the mid-1920s, or actually even before with writers, but officially it launched in 1924 um, with the Surrealism Manifesto, Andre Breton, Andre Breton defined the movement, which was both literal and visual. This was really not a style, but art that refers to or is interested in psychoanalysis. And the Surrealists were very much fascinated by the theories of Sigmund Freud. And they really looked into the unconscious mind. They were interested in dreams and mysteries of the subconscious and really looking at things bizarre, irrational, and marvelous. 
And this really developed from the idea of the psychic mediums in the 19th century France who would go into a trance and let spirits speak to it through them. They would then transcribe rather than translate ideas either verbally or through Morse code taps. So with the Surrealist, we'll start looking at De Chirico. Now, De Chirico was really interested in things like the intuitive and the irrational. And most of the environments that he creates in his art are very dreamlike. Not necessarily happy dreams, but they're very sort of, things don't necessarily make sense. And, um, Think about things here like we have this silhouette that's casting a shadow we actually um, don't see the figure that's casting it so it kind of almost creates a sort of ominous um, look to it he uses empty space very well if you notice we only have two figures in this whole little town area that we're looking at and these very strong diagonal lines and spaces coming toward us so we have our figure running along, just pushing her uh, hula hoop or her, her uh, ring with her stick, just running along, enjoying things. She has no idea this shadow she's about to encounter. And so there's a lot of strange juxtaposition going in his works. Um, at first you think, oh, that's very pretty and it's very architectural. He was highly interested in architecture. So he does very good renderings of buildings and things as well. But again, really brings in this sort of large amount of empty space and sort of this ominous figure. Now, the one you probably heard of is Salvador Dali, and this is his persistence of memory. And when we talk about Dali, he is a little different than some of our other surrealists, as he came in kind of in, late in the game, I guess, into the style and he is very very precise in his rendering of forms but most of his forms couldn't possibly be real um, he creates a strange amount of spatial illusion um, and then this juxtaposition juxtaposition of like very unrelated objects for example our clocks here are they suggestive of time are they suggested if things have stopped what are what are we looking at that kind of idea um, and a lot of his objects really have representation of something else. Think about um, if you've looked at any kind of dream interpretation, usually something in the, in the dream is meant to mean something else. And so the Surrealists really explored this whole idea and Dali just grabbed that and ran with it. He loved it. And he loves all these like amorphic shapes that we see here. With the figure in the middle with the closed eye. Um, it could be a number of different objects. And even when you start looking at his paintings, um, there's sort of this ambiguity in his space. Um, is this open area very, is, is it huge with mountains in the distance? Um, is the building to the left, or is it a building? Or is it just this little tiny little platform that you can step up onto? Or is it this massive building that's going along? I mean, it's just, it's really hard to tell what his space is. And that's kind of the point. Um, think about in dreams, you can't really make sense of everything that's going on. Um, you may be standing in one place and 30 seconds later you're somewhere else, or you change directions and it's a whole new landscape in front of you. And that's really things that the Surrealist looked at. And then we have Moreau. And one of the things that the Surrealists really loved, I mentioned when I was introducing them, kind of these theories of um, um, the psychic mediums that would go into a trance and let the spirits speak through them. And they wouldn't try to interpret things, but they would just transcribe them. And this idea of automatism, and they would put, the Surrealists would put themselves into a trance either through hypnotism, through exhaustion, through psychotropic drugs, those kind of things. Um, they would put themselves kind of in this state between asleep and awake 
and they would allow their mind to draw um, and work through their hand. And so they would scribble, they would write words, they would form these shapes, and then when they came out of it, they would fill them in in some way. And Moreau was really big on that here. And then he has all of his, his little creatures, which I absolutely love. Um, this is kind of his carnival of the Harlequin. Um, the swarm of these odd little creatures. And a lot of these would have been automatic drawings that he turned them into creatures. Um, he wouldn't try to change them. He wouldn't adjust the shape of them so much. But he may add eyes and a face. He may add legs. Those kind of things. And so really this idea of your hand automatically creating something or even close your eyes and sort of doodle and you look down sometimes and say oh I've drawn these lines and you color it in and change it into something else and that's kind of the same idea among the surrealists in this style and much of Moreau's work really began as sort of this free drawing now Max Ernst was really interested in processes. Um, we have this giant amorphous blob here as the artist, which is really kind of talking about letting things flow through to create. And um, then act more, more of that than actively creating a subject or a design. And he often made these hybrid creatures. Um, he actually developed a couple of techniques to create different textures on papers for the surrealist. Um, and sort of just played with, again, this idea of doodling things, letting it flow through him, and then just sort of creating images from that. And he often would make hybrid creatures. Um, this one kind of looks like a combination of a bird of some sort and maybe a human or the back end of a horse, I don't, some, kind of, some kind of amorphous or multiple kind of person, multiple kind of creature. Okay, so around the same time that the Surrealists were working in France, um, the De Stille was also coming about in the Netherlands. And we looked at Mondrian way back at the beginning of the semester when we talked about line and color, I believe. And this group of artists was led by Piet Mondrian. And this was a group of Dutch artists who really took cubism more toward more toward a more utopian kind of speculation. Um, these are non-representational, so non-objective objects. Um, geometric elements, very, very important. And the goal was really to kind of create a world of universal harmony. Um, they did use the golden section to make things comfortable and easy to see, to read. And they really looked for universal order through very, very basic shapes. He reduced his paintings to four elements, line, shape, color, and space, and that is all that he used. And he really tried to keep everything very much rational and orderly. And you can really st still see the influence of the Distill si style even today, um, particularly in this region. Think like IKEA furniture and things. You have simple, clean lines, very orderly, very basic. And that's really the distill values in art. Okay, let's move on to abstract expressionism. And now, again, think about Dada and surrealism and things really starting to question what is art. And so when we talk about abstract expressionism, you'll see a lot of that come into fruition as well. So abstract expressionism is really a culmination of the expressive tendencies, tendencies from Fauvism and German expressionism, as well as this automatic style that we see in surrealism. So it's really building on a number of the, of the period styles that we've looked at so far. Um, Jackson Pollock was the lead, leading innovator for abstract expressionism. Um, in the 1940s and early 50s, Jackson or Pollock did these poured paintings. And he was really searching for a way to express primal human nature. Um, he had studied Navajo sand paintings and then also Carl Jung's theory of the unconscious. 
and really sort of explored the process of creating paintings um, as much as the end result of the painting. And this is his autumn rhythm number 30, which is made by dripping thin paint onto canvas rather than brushing it on. Um, and these are massive um, um, canvases. So he would do things like hang paint from the ceiling or he'd hang painting cans from the ceiling and spread it around. He would walk around the painting with a very heavy brush or punch holes into the can and move it around, but he still composed. He created balance. He created, he was still trying to create harmony in his work. But one of the things about his is he didn't feel that there was any kind of an accident. Um, if it happened, it was supposed to happen in the painting. These huge swooping gestures um, and this movement in his, what, what are called action paintings, um, he really tried to enter the space of the painting physically and psychologically. And so while he was working, if cigarette ash, ashes fell in, if a bug landed on it and died there, they stayed in the painting. So nothing was considered an accident. It was just part of the composition as he moved around. So really, these action paintings were more of the, the part of creating the painting than the end result itself. So um, during, but during the same time that he was doing this, there were color field painters like Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko who were using large areas of color without a central focus, much like this. Um, and those are color field paintings, which are again, generally very large. And as they're named, they contain large fields of color. And this is Vic Heroic Sublimus um, by Barnett Newman or Man Heroic Sublime. And the title of this actually refers to Newman's essay, The Sublime Is Now, in which he poses the question, if we are living in a time without a legend that can be called sublime, how can we be creating sublime art? So again, um, these artists are looking back to psychological theories. Um, here, rather than Freud, they're looking at Jung and his theory of the collective unconscious. And basically, that is a series of archetypes that are recognized all, by all members of a species. So if you want to learn a little more about the psychological stuff, look up Jung, you can look at Freud and some of their theories as well. And so in response to these, Newman really wanted to take a single color and remove it from its associations. Um, violence, passion, fire, etc. those kind of things for red. And he really wanted to have the reviewer react to the color on their own. And these are paintings, when you are looking at them, he actually, you seem like, with it being such a large painting, you feel like you should have to step back and look at it because it's so large. But he actually wants you to get close so you're almost completely enveloped into the painting. And all of these individual lines of various shades of red are called zips. Um, and he really looked at them not as lines on the canvas, but as almost openings to something beyond. Almost as if you could come up and see the, the, the small little line on the far left as being behind the rest of the painting. Um, to really suggest something much more beyond what we're looking at within this painting. Okay, so while Newman was rather precise in his single field of color, Mark Rothko worked in multiple tones and colors on his color field paintings. Um, he was Russian born. He moved to the US at the age of 10 with his family. And a lot of his early work was really had a lot of mythological implications going on. Um, actually about Four, maybe five years ago, there was a, um, an exhibition of his at the Arkansas Arts Center that had a lot of his early works in it. And they were really interesting because they do have a lot of mythological um, forms in them, or they were really inspired by like primitive or folk art. And so he 
begins simplifying things and simplifying things and simplifying things, and he gets down to these color fields. And um, his work really matured from representation of mythological subjects into these rectangular fields like you see here. And But between his early style of primitivists and playful urban scenes and he and then these color fields that you see here was this really long period of transition. And it actually was marked by two really important events um, in his life. And one was the onset of World War II. And then the other was he started reading Friedrich Nietzsche. And Rothko actually said of them that, quote, I realized that historically the function of painting large pictures is to paint something very grandiose and pompous. The reason I paint them, however, is precisely because I want to be very intimate and human. To paint a small picture is to place yourself outside your experience. To look upon an experience as a stereo stereopticon view or with a reducing glass. However, if you paint the larger picture, you are in it. It isn't something that you command. So he created these to really put himself into his painting. And his works are large and they are very layered. Um, when you look at these, you kind of see a little bit of the white going around. But when you're actually physically in front of one of his paintings, you notice that there may be 10 different layers of color that he's gotten, that he's painted through to get the exact color that he was wanting and to, um, to get to the final stage. So again, much like Barnett's, there's really this suggestion that there is something beyond what you're looking at. Okay, so let's move on to pop art and minimalism. Now, these are two major movements of the early 1960s and really offer clues to the different directions of art in like late 20 and 21st centuries. Um, so both of these really established or rejected established expectations about art's aesthetic values and the need for originality. Um, both completely eliminate, eliminated emotional content that really implied by the artist's individual approach. Um, that something had been important to the previous generation of modern, something that had been important to the previous generation of modern painters. So the result from was that both of these movements effectively blurred the line distinguishing fine art from ordinary art. Um, and much like Dada asked, what is art? Um, pop art really makes us reconsider art's place and purpose in the world. So it was really wasn't made for it to be revered, set up on a pedestal, and just perfect. Um, so pop art really took its subject matter from lowbrow sources. Think comic books and advertising, things you see every single day. So commercial techniques were fully eliminated. Um, and you can see that here in Liechtenstein's Oh Jeff, I Love You Too, But from 1964. Now, Lichtenstein takes many of his subject matter from comic books and painted them onto canvases. And he even paints the dots, these bende dots is what they're called. And the reason they're like that is because um, comics now, not so much, but um, when they were printed in um, comic books and newspapers, they always had these dots at that time. Um, and he used little, very little shading in his work, really kind of recreating this single print coloring for um, comic books and things as well. Um, and we've talked about his and some of the things he does really approach some other political things later on. But for the most part, he really kind of gets this this idea from comic books and from advertising. And Warhol in particular was very big in pulling his subjects from advertising. Um, and we've talked about Andy Warhol in class when we were looking at printmaking techniques and how he found beauty in very ordinary objects, particularly packaging of products. And you can see that here with his Campbell soup cans. Um, and he would really use his artistic purpose as a way to address the overconsumption of products in like the 50s and 60s. And he actually began his career as a graphic designer and an illustrator in the advertising industry. 
So he was very familiar with what the, the public would respond to. Um, and so again, we kind of talked about him previously, so we're not going to go into him too far. Um, but just to kind of mention, everyone's seen the, the uh, Sam Campbell's soup cans, and he was really big into creating them. He had his group called The Factory that, that actually created a lot of his art for him or did his screen printing and things for him. Um, there was very little of his art, particularly after he'd been working for a while, that he touched himself, but it was his designs and it did come out of his shop. So he had no problems with mass production and um, the, the Campbell soup cans, there's lots of stories about how he would sell them to various museums and to individual collectors. And you would literally call and say, okay, how many cans of soup do you want? And they would tell him they were, they had this space. He was like, okay, put this many in there and this is how many you need. And um, he would have his factory create them and send them on their way. So again, really kind of blurring this line between high art and advertising. And again, silk screen was one of his big mediums and um, he had no problems with happy accidents, much like I talked about um, with uh, Jackson Pollock. There was no, there were no accidents. It just happened, it affected it because it was a very human thing to be doing. Okay, so minimalism. Um, minimalist objects are, was very, well, minimalism was very big in the 50s and 60s. Um, and minimalist objects are often square geometric or spare geometric forms um, with industrial processes and materials. They lack, they very much lack surface details, expressive markings, and then any discernible meaning. They are just very simplistic forms. Um, artists look to create art that would really exclude subject matter, symbolic meaning, um, and really content of any kind. And that was, that really sort of encompassed minimalism. Donald Judd, which you see here, was among the leaders. And he really never titled his work because he didn't want to, he didn't want the viewers to infer any meaning beyond the colors and shapes that he used if he named it something else. So this is his Untitled from 1967. It has no symbolic content and it's really concentrating on beautiful color and form. Um, and that's really what we're looking at when we talk about minimalism. It's very simple. Um, all decoration has been stripped away. Often it's just color and very, very basic forms using very, very basic materials. Okay, so I have this as the late 20th century and beyond section 310, but I'm not really going to talk about it. We've actually talked about a number of this. Um, think about when we talked about Marina Abramovic, some of the um, um, conceptual art happenings and things like that. And we really kind of covered that in chapter two. So um, 310 covers things like uh, conceptual art, which we have talked about. We talked about with Dada and the idea that the concept is more important than the finished product. Um, earthworks um, and then installations and happenings and things are in there as well. So just read through that section. Um, there may be a quiz question that pops up on it, but again, um, that's about all we're gonna cover for it. So I'm not gonna really go into the conversation on that. Um, just don't forget to do the Modern Art Discussion Board and take your quiz. And then you do have two um, inquisitives that you have to do this week. And that will wrap us up. See you all next week.